This is a Triple J podcast. This week we pop the question on which diamond is most ethical for when you pop the question. What happens when you get too many tick bites on your body? And what on earth is a light bucket? My name is Beck Charwood. All these questions are more answered in this week's episode. You're listening to Science Hour with Dr. Carl. And I've got something amazing to tell you, which is there is two bits of the moon inside the Earth. What? Yep. So the moon formed when about four and a half billion years ago, about 20 to 100 million years after the Earth formed, something the size of Mars ran into Earth and eventually there was a debris cloud which then led to the moon forming. But two chunks of this body, the thing the size of Mars, ended up inside the Earth and we've been noticing weird stuff with sound waves going through the Earth or uh, seismic shock waves going through the Earth. And what we've worked out is that down at the centre of the Earth, okay, detour. So the Earth has a solid crust and then halfway down to the centre it's all molten gloopy rock and inside that there's a ball of liquid iron. And so this bit of the that ancient rock that ran into us about four and a half billion years ago, there's two bits, each is about the size of Australia and a couple of hundred kilometres thick and they're sitting on top of the liquid iron about halfway down to the centre, one under West Africa, one somewhere under the Pacific Ocean and we're fairly confident that's the situation. The scientists are fairly humble saying we suggest that this is the case but it does seem to be true. Oh my goodness. I don't know what you can do with that information or how it'll make you wealthier but on the other hand, there it is. I mean, something for the, you know, star sign girlies to consider, you know, when they're talking about Mercury and retrograde, we're not thinking about the two big chunks of moon in the Earth. Excellent. (laughs) Hey, we have uh, Dr. Ellen from Melbourne on the line. Dr. Ellen? Dr. Ellen, what's your question for Dr. Carl? Hi, I was wondering about macronutrients. Mm -hmm. So you have this sort of daily, you've got to get this much protein, this much fat, this much everything. What's the actual range. Do I have to do that every single day or could I have loads of protein on the Monday and then a bit more carbs on the Tuesday and it all kind of levels out? Um, Firstly, I'm not an expert in this field. We need somebody who is a professor of dietetics and often we have Professor Claire Collins coming on, but I'll do the best I can. One thing we have is a study done on little toddlers who are able to feed themselves on anything they wanted, ranging from an infinite amount of sugar and uh, chocolate all the way up to infinite broccoli. And on each particular meal, they'd have a lot of this or a lot of that, but averaged out over about three or four days, it turned out they were having pretty well what the dietitians thought that they needed from the macronutrient point of view, macronutrients being fat, proteins, carbohydrates. So in general, I'd say you can, you don't have to have all of it each day. This is where I'm now going outside my range of knowledge, but you should have something moderately close to it. It's slightly different if you're trying to pump iron. And in that case, you need a bit of protein in your bloodstream while you're pumping the iron. But that can be as little as some chocolate milk. There's enough protein in chocolate milk. You only need the protein powder if you're really serious. Uh, Micronutrients are different. So with mushrooms, you should have them and tomatoes as part of your diet. Now, the mushrooms, their chemicals last the whole week. Tomatoes, you kind of need to have them at least every second day. There you are. I definitely don't know. Sounds, sounds like I'm on track. Yeah, I'm trying to go sort of whole food plant based, and it's like, oh, how do I get my protein? How do I get this? <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, try following No Time, No Money, Professor Claire Collins, University of, New South, uh, University of Newcastle, and she should get you off to a good start. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Ellen. Right now, we've got Dr. Jess from Victor Harbour. Another food based question. G'day. Um, I was wondering why foods taste and drinks taste different when they're cold than when they're hot. Ah, okay. So the first thing is that it's to do with lock and key. So the key works when it fits exactly in the lock. In the same way, that's how chemicals and hormones and drugs work in our body. Going to taste, on your tongue, you have at least five different classes of locks and keys, or rather the locks, and they are sweet, sour, salt, bitter, and umami. They operate differently at different temperatures. So think about fats. They're quite different in texture whether when they're about 10 degrees different in temperature, whereas sweet things are pretty well the same. They're still sweet. So that's why you get that different taste sensation when foods are hotter or colder because they're exciting 
the five different classes of receptors or locks in different ratios. And certainly uh, saturated fats taste absolutely delicious when they're hot and pretty crappy when they're cold. Is that why it's so hard to chew on pork crackling when it's... It's got to be hot, hasn't it? Yeah. It's got to be. But it's so yeah. delicious. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, we got another question on the text line from Lara. It says, Dr. Lara. Carl, can children wear coloured contact lenses safely? Yes and no. In general, you want to have what reality is coming into your head. However, there are some people who have various visual processing things, visual processing problems. So in my case, my problem is I can't recognise faces. Everybody's face looks the same to me. And other people have varying different problems here and there. And there is some degree of scientific basis, but not a lot, that coloured glasses can help in certain cases, but it's not very strong. But just to simply go out and say, we're going to have you green or blue, no, go with reality. But there are cases for thinking where coloured filters can sometimes help you, but that's not for most people. Dr Tyan from Dr. Victoria. Tyan. What's your question for Dr Carl? Dr Tyan, welcome. Hey doctors, my question is, why does my voice start to wobble and my eyes get really watery whenever I have a confronting or vulnerable conversation? Okay, now I know this sounds um, ridiculous, but possibly the most complex physical thing you'll ever do with your body is talk. It is really complex and it requires a lot of brain power. So you see people doing stuff in the Olympic diving and they'll do a twist and at one stage they'll uh, put their right arm across their belly and they'll take it out and they'll do it with very careful timing. Mate, that's brilliant, but talking is even more complex. And you've got to coordinate the pushing of air out of your lungs. You've then got to run the air past your voice box, your larynx. Now, think about a Christmas pie where you cut it and you take a little sector, a little slice out. That's what your vocal cords look like and there's a little V and it opens and closes very delicately and so you've got to control that and then you've got to control the muscles all the way above that and up into your mouth and then inside your mouth and then your lips and your tongue and then you, you put it all together. So in that case, when you haven't got enough brain power to think a really complex thought through, you can end up other things happening by themselves like your voice goes quavery, you begin to get teary, etc., etc. You just haven't got enough. We, we, we don't have enough brain power to do everything we need to. Evolution is not perfect, just good enough. Wow. Okay, so what I'm hearing is I actually have the hardest job of all uh, just because I have to talk all the time. <laughs> yeah, you, and, and you've got to walk at the same time and you've got to read the audience as well. Dr Flynn from Warriwood, how are you going? Good, thank you. <laughs> What's Hi, your question Dr. for Dr Carl? My question is how do you grow seedless mandarins if they have any seeds in them? Um, wow, that's a deep question. So one thing you can do is just simply graft a cutting, a little slice of that tree, and then you, you've got that little slice of that tree and you put it onto something that's robust, that's already growing, and you stick that in the ground, you marry them together, and you'll, when you look at it, you'll see that you've got this big robust thing coming out of the ground and suddenly it goes into this thinner thing and that's your little mandarin tree coming up. Another thing you can do is rely on the fact that there are some types of mandarins that naturally produce the next generation without having to go through seeds. We find this in certain animals, um, the whiptail lizard in the deserts, in the southern deserts of the USA, and sometimes uh, reptiles, they can do this where they can have a baby without um, a male. So a female gives birth to a female, gives birth to a female, and gives birth to a female. This is called parthenogenesis, which is not giving birth to a large Greek building, but it, it means, you know, birth. And um, what happens is that the egg from the female then splits and it gives off things called polar bodies, which have got half the DNA, and they normally are just out of the question. But sometimes those polar bodies can come back and mix up with the other half of the DNA. So sometimes there are species of mandarins that will do that naturally. And then they can do other techniques where they do hybridisation. Um, so it is a real technique. It does actually happen. You can't have them without seeds. So, Flynn, are you trying to grow some seedless mandarins at home? Uh, no, we just wanted to know. <laughs> okay, well, if you do, now you do. Thanks so much. 
Dr. Flynn. Right now we've got uh, Dr. Oscar. He's got a question now that the weather's getting a little bit chilly. What's your question for Dr. Carl, Dr. Oscar? Hey, doctors. Um, on my way to work this morning, there was this, like, fog in, like, certain areas and, like, heaps of fog where it was less developed with houses and, like, not many, not much fog when there was, like, full development going on. Is there a reason for this, Dr. Carl? Um, that would be probably because of the movement of air. So to have fog happening... Oh, OK, we'll, we'll just back up a bit. So water is a molecule made of three atoms... Two hydrogens, one oxygen in the shape of a boomerang. Hydrogen's on the outside, of the, on the tips of the boomerang, oxygen in the middle. They're, the hydrogens are positively charged, the oxygen is negatively charged. And on one hand, the tip of a boomerang wants to attract the angle, the point of another boomerang, so there's a slight attraction between them. So you've got these two forces. One is the weak attraction and the other one is the jittering. And they're always jittering and the higher the temperature, the more they jitter. So as you drop the temperature, you go down from independent water molecules just floating naked in the air by themselves into little droplets in the air, you know, water, and then finally into ice. Now you've got that background with fog. Firstly, you've got to have a high relative humidity, over 100%, and that happens as the temperature drops because they tend to come out and be, stick to each other. Secondly, you need condensation nuclei. You need tiny, tiny particles to help them do that. But I think this is the next factor, the stable air conditions. You've got to have very still air for fog to move, and I'm guessing that the houses have associated with them the use of energy and electricity and they're radiating heat and that's causing heat currents to form. So at my place, uh, I've got double glazing windows and I bought a little heat camera that you could plug into your phone and I just aim it at houses and out of my houses, there's hardly any heat coming out of the windows. Everybody else's house, it just pours like the windows open. In America... The figure is that one quarter of all the energy, all the electrical energy that is generated is used to adjust the temperatures inside dwellings where people live. So um, I'm guessing that that's the case. You said, can I just get this again, that it was where the houses were not, that's yeah, where, where you found the no fog? Houses, there was like heaps more fog and stuff. When, it, when, it, when there were no houses, there was more fog? Yeah, no houses, just yeah. like grassland. That, that, that's my guess, but I'm not a professional meteorologist, so if somebody from our beloved bomb could ring in and give us an answer, uh, and what's the magic number that they should ring in on, Dr Beck? 0439757555. So does that mean if you're using a lot more electricity, mm-hmm. you can tell because there's not a lot of fog around your house? Yes, providing you've got an area right next to your house, which is a control area, which has no houses in it, which is not that common in Sydney or any of the capital cities. Oh, Sorry about that. No, but, but that's, that, that, that's okay. a good scientific thought. I'm liking that. <laughs> We're all learning. Hey, we got another question from Dr. Brett in Victoria. What's your question for Dr. Carl? No, doctors. Um, I've just got this question. Uh, like I've, I've been looking at the moon through a telescope, whether it's uh, on a quarter moon, half moon, three quarter moon, full moon, doesn't matter. But you can always see the whole moon. Ah, so with the naked eye, you can kind of see the crescent and the rest of it is kind of hard to see. But when you're looking through a telescope, you can see the crescent and the stuff that you can't normally see with a naked eye. Is that what you're saying? Well, sort of. It's just it's, uh, it throws me off because, like, you know, I know that the world goes with the uh, with the moon and they've got like that bit of a wobble or whatever it is, whatever calculus they made up to fix it. But, um, you know, like just I can't understand why if I can't see it from here but I can pick it up on the telescope, you know, because I've right. done it a fair few times and um, it just doesn't make sense. I thought a smart man like you would have it. I'm not that smart but I was able to steal this from the clever astronomers. Okay. Now, astronomers do not call their telescopes telescopes. They call them light buckets. You got this bucket. Instead of your eye having a hole at the front, which is between two and eight millimeters across, they've got an opening which is like half a meter up to 10 meters. And so they can catch a whole lot of photons. And if you get all of those photons of light coming in and then concentrate them onto your retina, suddenly you can see things that you can't when you're only letting a small number of photons in. So it's because you've got a whole lot more photons landing on your retina that you can see what previously you can't when you're only relying on what can sneak through a little 
two or four millimetre hole as opposed to a telescope. For some reason, they call them in inches, like four inches or six inch telescope. Mm. So you're exciting more cells in your retina and so you're able to actually pick up the image, uh, whereas with just what comes through the naked eye, you can't. And so, by the way, with the naked eye, all you can see is about a thousand stars on a really good night in the outback. Uh, but with a telescope or even just binoculars, like a binoculars, 50 millimetres instead of just that four millimetres, you can see thousands of stars in the Milky Way, so much more than you can see with the naked eye. We have Dr. Ben on the line from Newcastle. What's your question, Ben? Hi, uh, hi, doctors. Um, my question is, um, I'm just wondering, I understand things like phones, electric cars, microwaves emit lower levels of radiation, which I understand are harmless to the general population. But what about people with um, tumor suppression gene uh, defects? Oh, do, do you have that? Is this personal? This is something my family has, but not me, not me, right. uh, my wife and child. Right. Um, okay, so firstly, there's two sorts of radiation. So the radiation field covers everything from gamma rays, which cause cancer, and X-rays, which cause cancer, and sunlight, the ultraviolet, causes cancer. And then it suddenly stops. All of those previous ones are called ionising radiation. They knock electrons off atoms. The moment you go into visible light, it stops. There's not enough energy. And then you work your way through visible light and infrared and microwaves and telephones and radio and TV, and they do not have enough energy to knock off the electrons, but they will interact with living chemicals, with with chemicals in general. And so while we're very confident that for the general population there is no increase in cancers for the general population with non-ionising radiation, people who have problems with tumour suppression uh, could be in a special uh, situation. So what happens is that your DNA is splitting all the time and making copies of itself and there are mistakes. And there is special hardware, software built into our cells that repairs those mistakes. And on average, there's about 40 mistakes made every second. And and the overwhelming majority are repaired in what I call regular people who don't have problems with not picking up these mistakes. By the way, a little detour. There's a little creature called a tardigrade and it's got eight legs. It's about a tenth of a millimetre long. You can get one of these and stick it on the outside of the International Space Station with no air and temperatures from minus 100 to plus 200 and radiation and bring it inside after two weeks and it'll come back to life. You can take it down to minus 270 degrees below zero and bring it back up again and it'll just come back to life. And they just found out last week that you can spray it with enough with, with 10,000 times more radiation than it's needed to kill a human being. It doesn't bother them. We've found out that what they have is the ability to pick up the mistakes made in the DNA whenever it makes a copy of itself or caused by radiation and repair it. And so they're looking at that as a technology to use for people with problems in the tumour suppression genes. So if we can find out how the tardigrades repair their mistakes and also repair the mistakes caused by radiation, then we can use that for people who have problems with the being able to pick up the mistakes anyway. So at this stage, the results, uh, I'm sorry to say this, inconclusive. We don't know. We simply haven't been able to get a whole bunch of people who have got problems with picking up the mistakes and repairing them and then spray them with radiation and then have a balanced uh, counter group and do a control study. At this at this stage, we're just saying we don't know. What would you okay. tend to go with? Would you tend to err on the side of caution until we know or what? That's. I think that that's generally what the community does for um, people with Lee Fraumini uh, syndrome, which ah. is a, a defect of the TP53 uh, um, tumour suppression gene. Is so, is? yeah, I think we'll err on the side of caution. Yeah. Now, but, but thank you very much. Oh, and by the way, there are people who sell stuff that puts out radiation to block radiation. Hippie bull dust. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's like saying um, uh, water will put out a fire and water is a liquid. So if you've got a fire, chuck petrol on it because petrol's a liquid too. Right? So when you're erring on the side of caution, don't buy those things that put out a radiation field to block the radiation field. They're lying to you. Okay, thank you. And best of luck with I hope things will go well Thanks, with your doctors. family. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ben. And now we have Dr. Lucas on the line who has a question about popping the question. Whoa. Hey, doctors. I hope you're all well. My question is about man-made diamonds. 
Yep. Or and, and there so, are women involved. Please, we, this is the woke station. You got to call them artificially made. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, Sorry. yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah uh, uh, artificial diamonds. Yep. So I'm under the impression that they are as real as a real diamond. Though I'm curious on one, the impact that we or when the man makes them, yeah, as opposed to us digging them up, and is the cost really that much more efficient? Is right. them like like as as a conjoined thing because they're not that much cheaper. Really? They're, they're not that ah, much cheaper. Okay. Now, how are you going to pop the question? Have you got it all planned? Uh, I can't blow any secrets. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give you a wait. National radio yeah. and all. Okay, well, let's well, hope she's not listening. Well, well, my marriage proposal was very romantic. I rang up my wife-to-be and I said, Hi, honey, I'm in a cheap hotel room in Asia injecting opiates into the buttocks of this young red-headed woman. I seem to remember I shouldn't do it in the buttocks. Wish I'd do it. And by the way, will you marry me? Then the line went dead. <laughs> so, okay, so okay. you're, yeah, okay. Yep. Okay, so uh, just, just give me some hints. Probably not that romantic. Okay, <laughs> oh, oh, come on. <laughs> well, okay. uh, what it shows is it doesn't need to be that romantic to last, apparently. Yeah. So, look, <laughs> there are questions. Firstly, with diamonds. So, diamonds are made underground, several hundred mm-hmm. kilometres underground, when carbon atoms are squashed together, and then, for whatever reason, they come to the surface in what's called a Kimberlite, K-I-M-B-E-R-L-I-T-E, and yes, that's related to the Kimberley Mountain in uh, South Africa where they found them. It comes to the surface in a Kimberlite, which can be anything from a metre to a kilometre wide. The one at the in South Africa is a kilometre wide and it's loaded with diamonds and it comes to the surface at speeds of like 70 to 200 kilometres an hour and then it cools down and then you go mining. Firstly, the environmental costs of mining it are higher than actually manufacturing it. Secondly, the cost is purely artificial. Uh, Back about 75 years ago, Mary Frances Geraghty, who was working in advertising, and because it was a very sexist world, they only let her work on women's products, which were diamonds. She came up 75 years ago with the most brilliant slogan that is so brilliant they still use it today. She said, a diamond is forever. And it's, it's, got, it's kind of weird gra- grammar because a diamond is a noun, but forever is a p- period of time. But it was so brilliant it stayed. And that, in the 1940s and 50s, let them crank the price up. And so they went with the, they're really rare, but they last forever. And so the whole idea of the diamond being related to marriage is an artificial thing that they came up with back then. So that allowed them to keep the price artificially high. And the people who make the artificial diamonds, they then say, oh, we'll just only cut them by about 10%, whereas really they're a lot cheaper. So there's a whole lot of things involved with all of that, but the symbolism is nice as well. So I have a question. Yeah. When it comes to like, is there other stones like diamonds that last as long that could be other forever stones? They're basically all forever. That diamond has one thing going for it. It is really hard. So if you have, say, I don't know, a sapphire or a ruby, and you happen to accidentally put it on a block of hardened steel and then drop another block of hardened steel upon it, it would probably shatter. But in day-to-day use, you'd, it, it is forever. But they really went with that combination of, oh, and by the way, it's so hard, it'll last forever till the end of the universe showing your love, blah, 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 violins in the background. Well, there you go. a bonus question. So the, but the artificial diamonds generally have like ultimate clarity? You can, if you go to enough trouble, find them with the same clarity. But at this case, I'd like to point out I'm not a jeweller, so go and talk with the jewellers and ask them and just sort of say, I'm serious, I want to know, just tell me the data. Um, and at one stage we were designing the wedding ring for my wife and she was saying, oh, I, I think it's got too many diamonds in it. And her mother said, you fool, you can't have too many diamonds in it. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lucas. Good luck with everything. Thank I hope you, she says yes. Now we have uh, Dr. Emma on the line. What's your question for Dr. Carl? Hi, doctors. Um, so my question is, what do you think about the current antimyal resistance? Um, and if there's been any new developments in the drug field lately? Um, so... We are losing the fight with bacteria with regard to antibiotics and there are new developments coming. 
So penicillin by itself increased human life expectancy by 15 years. Right? That is just That's a huge, huge jump. We're talking sort of like the middle of the Second World War. Okay? So the thing is that the bacteria, nothing personal. They don't like dying. They're going to evolve to avoid it. And they can evolve every 20 – oh, sorry, they can have babies every 20 minutes. And so they can go through lots of generations and they can evolve resistance to the antibiotics we have. Now, the thing is that – the drug companies do not make a lot of money out of antibiotics. What they make money out of is something that you have to take for the rest of your life, like anti-hypertension pills, something you take for two weeks. No. To develop an antibiotic is about $1.5 billion and 15 years, right? That's just the way it is. Um, and so we, are, we need to have the governments of the world working with the pharmacy companies to say, okay, we'll help you develop this thing. The new way are things called bacteriophages. A bacteriophage is a living creature. It's a virus. It looks like a moon lander. It's got four legs and in the middle it's got a little syringe. <clears throat> they land on top of a bacterium. They inject the syringe into the bacterium and they put many copies of themselves and they kill that bacterium. Bacteriophages, bacteria, phage means to eat, they kill half the bacteria on Earth every two days. So the, you might have heard of the Ganges River had this reputation for being the sacred river and when people went filtering the water they found bacteri- viruses in their bacteriophages that could kill certain diseases. So before it became polluted it actually had these bacteriophages in vast quantities. So we're trying to develop bacteriophages. The trouble is it's not one size suit all. You've got an infectious with insert name of bacterium. I give you this type of penicillin. That's all I need to know. You will live instead of dying. But with a bacteriophage, I have to look at the bacterium and get its genetic code, which we can do nowadays. You can get a box a bit bigger than a matchbox that you can hold in your hand and in 20 minutes it can map a virus for you. People take it into the field with them. So what we need to do is get this technology out so that you map the the DNA of the bacterium and then you choose the right bacteriophage which chase that bacterium and you inject the bacteriophage into you and off it goes and it kills the bacterium. Wow. We're heading down that pathway now. Does that answer your question, yeah. Dr. Emma? Yes, it does. Thank you so much. No worries. we got uh, one more question from Dr. Ian about tick bites. What's your question for Dr. Carl? Hi, doctors. Um, my question is, do we have any um, long-term research or studies about uh, long-term exposure to tick bites. I, I, I work in the bush and I've been bitten probably 200 times over the last wow. 10 years. Well, you, you haven't been one of those people who got bitten by a bite, uh, a tick, and then ended up allergic to meat for the rest of your life? No, I've heard about that, but not so yeah. far. Yeah. So that happens to roughly one Australian each week living on the east coast of Australia. And so long as you avoid that, um, wow, because ticks are hard to stop because they're physical creatures that land on you and then burrow in. Um, There is a possibility that further down the line, if you keep on getting bitten by the same type of tick, there might be little uh, chemicals that it has that your immune system will not lo- we will we'll then build up an allergic reaction to. So you can have a situation which goes either way, either that you've got these people who get stung by bees their whole lives and it doesn't bother them until suddenly it does. So in that case, they can go from being okay with it to not and then vice versa. So I'd mention it to your GP, but in general, all I can say is something dumb like avoid tick bites, which is hard if your job is out in the bush and you're brushing. Yeah. How, how do you get the ticks landing on you? Are you out in the bush and they well, brush on you? Yeah, basically, I'm in the bush and often in the long grass. That is year, hard. This year is particularly bad for it. Does um, DEET work against them? Uh, I'm experimenting with that now. Yeah. In general, I'd um, say try to avoid it, but sometimes you can't. I was wondering more in terms of liver and uh, and kidneys. Oh, okay. If you see a GP and the uh, liver 
and kidney function is really easy to test with a regular blood test. Just say, look, I'm worried about this and they'll do LFTs, which are liver function tests and they're not expensive and they're part of the general thing and EUC electrolytes and uh, urea concentrations and both of those can monitor your liver and kidney functions really well. So ask your GP specifically for the Uh LFTs, the liver function tests. Okay, great. Thank Thanks you so up, much, Tom. Dr. Ian. I actually have another tick-related Hurrah. question. If I can jump in as yeah, the yeah. last question. So another kind of tick. I get physical ticks mm-hmm. uh, where my limbs will just move uncontrollably, usually when I'm tired or when I'm stressed. And I just want to know what, what's happening in my body to cause the main one I get is my I hit myself in the chest like a kind of like beating my chest like a gorilla. What's what what's the science behind that? Um The human body runs in a thing called homeostasis, which means you've got things accelerating and decelerating in every single function of your body, whether it's listening or hearing or your heart beating or your lungs breathing or how much water goes across the membranes. And your muscles are regulated to do just enough to have you ready to react in an emergency, but not so they self-trigger. So... At one extreme, have you heard of the disease called tetanus? Yes. Yeah. So with tetanus, it's caused by a bacterium called Clostridium tetani and people say, oh, you stepped on a rusty nail, okay, get your tetanus shot, right? So what that does is it switches on all your muscles. And the classic picture is really terrible. It's of a, normally the one in the medical textbooks, is a naked man with his back arched and the only thing touching the ground are the heels and the back of the head. Now, the reason is that your back muscles are much stronger than your tummy muscles. So your back arches that way. And then the muscles on the front of your legs are stronger than the muscles on the back of your legs. So they then, oh, sorry, the ones on the back are stronger. So they then turn you into this arch and all of your muscles are switched on, wait for it, including the muscles that run your lungs. Oh, wow. So instead of being able to breathe in and breathe out, that's it. You don't breathe, you die. So that's the extreme case. So for most of us, we're just at that point where we can react to a situation rapidly, but it's not on all the time. And so depending on various medications that people take or various natural situations anyway, sometimes that set point can be just pushed a little closer and every now and then you just sort of go bang, bang, bang and and, and you have this physical TIC uh, which is spelled differently from a T-I-C-K. I do get it from the medication that I take. Yeah, so ah. so the um, set point can be just pushed a little bit and the basic thing comes to us from 500 years ago, all drugs are poisons, what matters is the dose, what matters is the benefit-harm ratio. Thanks so much for listening to this week's episode of Science with Dr. Carl. If you have a burning question that you want to ask Dr. Carl, tune into Triple J 11 till 12 every Thursday and the number you need to know 0439 757 5. My name is Beck Charlwood and this episode was produced by Sarah Harvey. If you listen to the Dr. Carl podcast for the answers to a few curly questions, you might also want to know just what's happening inside Pine Gap the top secret joint defence facility in Central Australia. Wouldn't we all? Built on a lie, on stolen land and shrouded in secrecy, just what's going on in our backyard? And how much of a target does it make the town of Alice Springs? Join me, Alex Barwick, for the story of Pine Gap in Expanse Season 3, Spies in the Outback.